Uh, so I was married for almost two years. We had been together for five years. He proposed pretty quickly after eight months. And then we were engaged for two years, had this beautiful dream wedding. Um, and everything seemed pretty, pretty great. Uh, mm -hmm. It was nearing our two year anniversary that, you know, the last six months started to get rocky. Um, I didn't understand why we started going to therapy. I was working my ass off to try and mm -hmm. get back to a place of happiness and it just wasn't working. It was like, you know, walking into a wall. And eventually I discovered that he had been having an affair with a 19 year old for six months. Um, since the book has blown up, um, I've been reached out to by other women, um, oh. with, with stories and apologies. Um, so I, I don't know how many people, you know, he was stepping out of our marriage for, but I do know that the 19 year old was the most consistent and they were in a full on relationship. Um, so I found this out, filed for divorce, left, um, it felt like a weight had been lifted off of my shoulders. I really feel like I dodged an army of snipers when, mm -hmm. when he gave me such a clear out. Mm -hmm. Um, and shortly after that, I met a guy and we fell head over heels in love with each other, had this whirlwind romance. And he invited me to join him on a month long trip to Italy, met his family. Everything was amazing. We were like, this is it. This is why the divorce happened. You know, mm -hmm. he was telling his friends, this is the woman I'm going to be with forever and have babies with like we're done. 48 hours before we were getting on a plane, he tells me he needs to go by himself and breaks up with me. And I was absolutely devastated. Like he broke my heart. Like my ex-husband never could have done. Mm -hmm. And sitting on my bed in a pool of tears, <laughs> I said, okay, well, Gabrielle, you have a decision to make. And that's either stay at home heartbroken or go travel Europe for a month by yourself. So I took a backpack and I did six countries over the span of the month and wrote, eat, pray, FML about it. The best, <laughs> the best title on planet earth. Um, a lot of your story for me seemed like this idea of love and finding different aspects of it. And I think you found it along the journey. So can you relate to me on like how, what you learned about love in the process. Cause you went through this insane breakup and this insane divorce and then fell right in love right away and then fell out of it. So what was like love throughout this process? Like for you of the different types and how did you work through that along your way? Well, it's interesting to reflect back on that now, uh, knowing the things that I know and that, you know, years of my life have continued on after what people read in Eat, Pray, FML. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I didn't know the term love bombing at oh. the time. Um, and for those that are listening that don't know what that is, it's basically when you enter into a relationship and everything starts happening very, very quickly. It's like, mm -hmm. you're automatically the girlfriend. You're automatically meeting family. Oh my God, I love you. Oh my God, go to Europe with me. Oh, you know, all the things because that person on the other end has some type of void within mm -hmm. themselves and they see something in you that makes them feel better. So they think that more of you can fill that up within themselves which eventually they realize can't happen because nobody can fill that void within you except yourself. Mm -hmm. And when that realization happens, they bail or run or pull back. Um, and I now know that that's what was happening with Javier and I. I, at the time, had no clue what that was. So it just felt like the most real and amazing love I had ever experienced. Yeah. Um, and then to have that taken away from you at the height of a honeymoon stage, mm -hmm. when the other person was the one perpetuating all of it is so confusing, so devastating. It's like, you're just left being like, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't ask to be in this situation and now you're leaving. Yeah. Um, and it was really my first experience with heartbreak. You know, I've mm -hmm. had many relationships throughout my life in the past, but this was the one that broke me. Um, and I had never experienced that before. So it's still looking back on it was a very huge lesson for me to learn. Um, I wouldn't change any of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and really experiencing that type of intoxicating love is 
for me, when I realized that that love and the thing that he and I shared was toxic in the end Mm. was now I had to redefine my, my understanding of love, which in the second book, you know, this is a lot of what, what gets written about and where I was trying to find my way through, but I had had this, this experience with this man. And now it was like, well, if I don't feel that that's, it's not enough and something's missing. Mm -hmm. Um, little did I know I was searching for something that wasn't healthy in the first Mm -hmm. place. So I had to really like redefine my definition of love to be like, okay, that's not the example I want to be looking for. Um, and there are so many other things that are more important in a relationship than that thing. And that thing is often toxic when you really step back and look at the facts of a relationship. Yeah, that's major, especially because I feel like media especially puts that thing, that love bombing almost, that crazy, like, oh, I'm obsessed with you. I can't take my hands off of you. That is put on a pedestal and what we think yeah. is the ultimate. So it can be hard to find other signs of it in real life because I think a lot of times we have the fairy tale idea of love or that idea of like, you cannot be away from this person, but I feel like real love looks so different and often totally. it's not that hot and heavy. Um, sometimes I feel like it's slower. I know love it can play differently for everyone, but what? How did you start to look for that positive aspect of love that you were trying to find? Was it like looking towards your other people or other relationships? Like, how did you figure that out for yourself? Well, I think it started with, I needed to love myself first Mm -hmm. and I didn't know how to do that. Um, People always say, you know, you have to love yourself first before you can love someone else or loving yourself is the most important thing. And I was like, okay, cool guys. I get it. Um, can anyone let me know how to do that? Yeah. <laughs> and nobody could give me a clear explanation on how to love yourself. So I knew when I was on my Europe trip that that's something I was searching for. I didn't, I, I got pieces of it on my mm-hmm. journey. I didn't necessarily put it all together until I came back, which is why it's written in the epilogue of Eat, Pray, FML, but it's called the self-love cocktail. And what you do is you sit down and you write out a list of things that you're capable of giving yourself that your soul loves, not Mm -hmm. that you need from your man or a parent or a friend, things that you can give yourself daily that make your soul happy. And you commit to doing things on that list every single day. At first, it's like one or two things. It'll be a stiffer cocktail, like a vodka martini. And then you continuously show up and do those things till you can add in more ingredients and it becomes like a fun mixology cocktail. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, you wake up feeling so much better and it's because you're loving yourself. Mm -hmm. When I realized that loving yourself is as simple as giving your soul the things it loves, it was mind blowing to me Mm -hmm. because then I could actually have something to do. I had a checklist. I had something that I could control. I didn't need to look at myself in the mirror and be like, I love you, Gabrielle, and feel like a freaking psycho. Yeah. Um, I mean, like more power to you if you can do that. That's what it is. Yeah. Didn't work for me. Um, So it was really life-changing when I realized that. So that was the first step that I Mm -hmm. needed to, to figure out. That's not to say that if you're in a relationship and you don't really love yourself, that you can't learn how to do that while you're in that relationship. I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. Um, But for me, I I really needed to get that piece of the puzzle into place. After that, and this comes up a lot in the the Ridiculous Misadventures, is I had to rediscover what love felt like um, because it came wrapped in a totally not what I was expecting package. And I fought it a lot, was like, Mm -hmm. this isn't, this isn't the person I'm supposed to end up with. Like, this is missing or this is different and this. And I had to really walk through a lot of my own fear um, before I was able to accept that type Mm -hmm. of love. And it really taught me a lot about getting out of your own way Mm -hmm. and not letting fear of past things dictate how you operate moving forward. Yeah, that's a major, major point. But I mean, all of that is so helpful. And I think there's that quote from, what is it? Perks of being a wallflower that we accept the love that we think that think that we deserve. And then changing that idea of what you think you deserve is going to change what you, what love you're calling into your life. 
Um, I think, yeah, it all starts with yourself because when you're not loving yourself and I know everyone says do that, but if you're truly not, then you're, how is anyone going to love you from the outside? Well, cause you're literally telling the universe what you're okay with. Yeah. So if you're okay with the bare minimum that you're giving to yourself, of Mm -hmm. course, the universe is going to send you a guy that's going to give you the bare minimum. That's what you're saying. I'm, I'm okay with, I approve this message. Yeah. (laughs) Very true. Another um, thing that you leaned on in the book that I want you to break down for me is the thought onion, which I think is very powerful because if I have in my past have gone through like telling negative self-talk or just telling myself what I think is true or what I think other people's other people think of me or anything that you can tell yourself, but Mm -hmm. I love that you remove the layers of whatever your thoughts are to get to that deeper spot. So talk me through your thought onion and how it works. So the thought onion is basically my technique that I came up with to really analyze your thoughts and reactions in order to see what's under the surface and what you're holding within you subconsciously that needs to be addressed or healed. So you look at it like an onion (laughs) and the first layer is the superficial thought. And that's really your knee jerk reaction when something happens, like before you can even really process it, the initial thought or reaction that comes out in the situation. And you take a step back and peel that layer back and you get to the authentic thought. Mm -hmm. And that's usually once you've, you know, sat and thought about it for a few minutes, the emotion that caused that knee jerk reaction in the first place. So it's a little deeper than the the initial superficial thought. And then you step back and peel that layer back and you get to the subconscious thought. And when you can get to that layer, that's usually a trauma that you experienced, a situation that was very impactful in your life a belief that you've been carrying for a very long time. And when you can get to that layer, that's when you can be like, okay, this is something that I need to heal or adjust or work on in order to have a different reaction in the future. Mm -hmm. And it's really, it's a really way to, you know, heal yourself when you can get to those subconscious layers um, without needing, you know, to sit with a therapist and you can do it. You know, I've done thought onions five minutes while I'm walking on the street. I've done them, you know, over the span of 24 hours when I really need to like sit and marinate on them. But some of the things that I've uncovered from doing it is life-changing and Mm -hmm. really has allowed me to look at things that have happened in my life that are now dictating, you know, things that I'm experiencing on a day-to-day current basis from Mm -hmm. years and years and years ago. Yeah. We, I think that's so interesting because we can have all these ideas of ourselves or traumas that we've gone through or experiences from childhood or anything that we've built up that kind of interprets, interprets how our life is now. And I think when you just look up on things on the surface, it doesn't really seem like they're connected, but when you, like you do remove those layers, take things back. If you're working on yourself at all, I think that's very helpful to do because a lot of the times the things that we're manifesting or doing or anything that's happening in life is related to that younger self who had experienced trauma. And it can be like really major trauma or just like someone stole my lollipop and I totally have all these ideas around that. And now I I created my life around this trauma that I had as a kid. So I think that's a really powerful too. And something that's really practical that everyone can do. Um, So thank you for walking me through that. (laughs) Yeah. I, I think that when people can realize that those subconscious beliefs are literally like having someone in the driver's seat that isn't you and you've Mm -hmm. just been on autopilot and you don't understand why every time something happens to you, the car swerves to the right. Mm -hmm. And when you can get to that subconscious layer, that's why the car is swerving right. And if you can adjust and fix and heal that, and sometimes it's even just being aware of it. Sometimes there's not anything to necessarily do. Um, Then you can recorrect the car and be in control again. Mm -hmm.